welcome back to the second episode of Talking Art Music Science with Ajay Srinivasamurthy, Kaustu Kanti, and Ranjini and Vigneshishwari. And we continue where we left off last time. And I'm going to ask again a very basic question. Why are we doing this? Why are you digging into music and breaking into this little bits, bits, looking at information, gathering it? Why? Ranjani. Ranjani. Okay. Why? Sure. So, so, so look at it as technology tools, okay, which is going to be interesting, not just for uh, learners. Uh, it's also for connoisseurs. And then it's also yeah. for musicians themselves. And uh, uh, it can be looked as for a learning uh, or a pedagogy system, or you want to look at musicology, or you want to understand the composition, or you want to do a very, uh, you know, like how we do a Google search. Uh, we want to do a Google search on music for Indian music. For oh. different components, various abstraction levels, you want to look at a particular phrase, you want to look at a particular artist, you want to look at a particular instrument, you know, you can just go to different attributes. So give me a couple of examples. Just give it for me to, for, for us to understand. Give me a couple of examples of, of some information that you have, or mm -hmm. you'll be able to gather from this, these processes. Mm -hmm. And we can see how useful it is. Okay. So, so uh, in terms of examples, okay. So uh, for learning itself, if, uh, if you would want, uh, you would want some sort of a feedback. So you learn from uh, your teacher, you go back home and you want, uh, if there's an aid, so as to correct whatever you're singing while you're doing it, then it's a faster process to learn. So mm -hmm. is there a mechanism so as to score and correct whatever we are singing? That would be definitely very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, that is one aspect, right? And then uh, in terms of musicology, you can think of it as uh, you want to do a comparison across different schools of learning. What, what kind of phrases do these people do? What kind of phrases do those people do? That's one, one way you can look at it. Uh, or, or if you want to do a Google search, as I told, that's, that's probably very, very uh, popular thing that most of us would want. Uh, you have a lot of... Uh, uh, now, you, now you have Amazon Music and so on and so forth, right? You, have, you don't even need to store anything in your... Uh, in your mobile, forget your computer, right? Everything is in the cloud. So now I just want to search even within the cloud. Give me this particular uh, person's for this particular raga. What is the most uh, used phrase? And and how do how does that system get into that? So we need to build tools for that. Yeah, you know, I'm just going to try and uh, you know just uh, add to what you said from uh, musician's angle. You know, in many ways, if you look at our our way of notating something, you know, I learned something and I notate it. It's at, at a very basic level, it's signal processing and machine learning. Oh, yes. uh, yes. Because that's exactly what I'm doing. If I notate it, why am I notating it? Because I am trying, the signal is what I learned. Uh, I've gathered the signal. And uh, the machine process is the process of the machine actually putting it down as data, as, as information, which I can, again, reprocess to back to the signal itself in some manner, right? So when I notate it, I, am, I can understand, say, this phrase. I sing it first and then I say, what did I exactly sing? This is what I sang and I write it down. And then I say, okay, the next time I sang it, I didn't sing it exactly the same way. I sang it with a little gar twist over here. So I'm just trying to, uh, you know, shall we say, take out from what you said in the, yes. saying that it's not really alien to the way we behave as people because there is this uh, anxiety many times in the world of arts uh, when you discuss technology and when you discuss signal processing or machine learning, that there's something very really artificial happening, that this is not natural. In a way, it is actually very natural to the process in the way uh, human beings uh, have been processing information and have been trying to actually learn. I'm just trying to, uh, you know, connect it with how we behave. That's all. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you were to abstract this whole process, right? So it is essentially, as you said, uh, it's the problem of transcription. So given that we have an audio recording, what information can we transcribe out of it? As I'm listening to the audio recording, what are the things I can note down? I can mark down phrases. We could mark down where like different uh, uh, structures of uh, like Tala are kind of occurring or uh, tonic is like a very basic annotation which says where it was sung. And then what we, we are doing is like the whole like the set of tasks. If you put an umbrella over it, it's, it's called content-based description. So right now, say if we buy a, say, for example, uh, we don't buy CDs anymore. Uh, yeah. If we, <laughs> if we go and then start streaming some music, we, we start seeing some basic information on what's there in that music. Like say it, it could say a particular artist uh, singing in a particular raga and a particular kruti. But then can we actually go down and then understand what's in the content and then use mm -hmm. that description to enhance our listening 
so that uh, it's like having someone who can describe what's happening with the music as we are listening to it it could be for expert listeners or for anybody like and as she said for students to understand what's like exactly happening so that they can learn from it right for, yeah for example you want to search a phrase across all the recordings that you have signal processing and machine learning helps you do that you want to you want to use a phrase for certain analysis of similarities between different ragas or melodic structures then machine learning and signal processing help you do that yeah. so if music analysis can be let's okay i'll use the word for the first time over here music analysis listening experience can become automated hmm. using so using a word that musicians don't like to listen to huh? automation <laughs> yeah. so don't use <laughs> words like automation you no, just just to add like, that there huh? there is there's there's a lot of like i i i understand that there is a little bit of apprehension with automation yes but then, but then the, the the question is like so these things why as human beings and as musicians and music students we are able to do yes. it already why do we actually need machines to do it for us again right so that's where the automation part and the scale comes in so hmm. the scale at which that we are operating right now uh, especially with uh, with all the i mean it's it's not only in music but everywhere uh, the amount of music that is produced and then is consumed is so huge that it's physically impossible for any single set of human beings to actually do this and then the automation actually helps us to in uh, organize this information better which is pretty much exactly what google's whole claim is about hmm. it's about organizing information and then uh, we are kind of saying we are organizing information of music uh, in a way that is accessible and meaningful to for consumption by human beings correct i'll i'll add the culturally aware part of culturally it as well part of it. yeah that's something that's we'll have to immediately get to as soon as please go ahead please go ahead so i i what if you go ahead because so can you go ahead yeah sure so i i bring the term back computational musicology that in the first episode you were kind yes. of attracted to oh. so this is one of our aims because we are also musicians and having background in musician uh kind of aids to the passion what kind of musically relevant problems we can solve so one mm. of them is to kind of objectify so there are some subjective elements in music understanding and there are some objective elements okay. so we address first the objective elements for for example the framework which is the raga or the tala but also the say invariant among the variations for example i am learning one raga and i am following five stalwart artists performances Hmm. so there is something tying along which doesn't lose track of the rag but still there are so many variations okay so one problem we address is called music similarity vis-a-vis music dissimilarity hmm. so how similar or how dissimilar are these two pieces and in what perspectives or what features and so this computational musicology kind of addresses that or say modularize them to different uh, scalable and discriminative features where we can say okay this artist this treatment of this phrase is different from the other in this following set of ways hmm. so we kind of objectify and what a musicologist does in principle is to hand calculate all of this Correct. which is which has two limitations so one is it's not scalable he cannot uh, do this for hundred of artists for thousands of concerts and the second thing is it's not reproducible so yes. it after 10 years the same musicologists can't reproduce whatever the context was but with this machine learning approach we can scale it up to thousands of collections and reproduce the results so we have a benchmark and okay. we can also talk about this culturally aware uh, thing is very important that we talk about for example the same tools we develop for hindustani and carnatic music should be aware of what the concept is in there because yes. ultimately it's uh, us scientists who are training the models So definitely machine learning understand it but we let the machine know how to learn it exactly so yeah we know the music we if we are aware of the culture then the technology is more relevant and it can give something back to the community i mean i mean it's important i mean you make an interesting point on culture so i just want to just uh, you know um, try and understand a, a bit better when I mean, you use that word culture so is the culture um, or uh, telling you what kind of problem first you should address first of all what I mean, identifying a problem itself is a big process, right? Yes. So uh, unless you know the culture, you don't know the problem. So, uh, so right. that is one. But isn't there also another? Uh, isn't there the opposite that sometimes is a problem? So, in the sense, knowing the culture doesn't it limit you from seeing the perception from somebody who is not in the culture, for example? Now, is yes. that also something you can so, think of? For example, 
um, like you said, tonic may be a very basic thing. Something is something that I would naturally recognize, right? And the moment I've recognized tonic, I can probably at least figure out what raga is or approximately what raga is. Now, if I come from a culture right. where there is no tonic as a basis of understanding melody, can you help that person? So, sure. uh, so I would say there are two things. One is one is innate musical appreciation. For example, uh, very consonant intervals. One doesn't need a music training to appreciate that. It that, even that, affects that is just an uh, auditory system that is in that function. Right? That's a biological phenomenon. Yeah. But the acquired phenomenon, if we know about that, so this kind of solves certain problems that is still need some space to solve. But yeah, I totally agree with you. Sometimes exploratory approaches also work. So maybe it limits us to hunt for something which is interesting in the music already, but it's not getting discovered because we are limiting our approaches to something which we already know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Adding on to what you had said, TMK. Uh, so so if, if you want to look at, uh, uh, you know, having that cultural awareness brings into picture what kind of problems we want to look at. Tonic identification definitely is not a big deal if you look at Western music. They, they already, uh, you know, certain set of uh, scales that they have and uh, that's how they'll go about. Uh, so you'll choose one among those and go ahead. Uh, but for them, chord identification is a very big thing. We don't have that problem at all for us. That yeah. That is not a part of our music, right? And for us, probably what would be uh, not as a challenge, but something that we look for is uh, you, have a, uh, you have a Kriti and you have a Alapna. Both of them in the same Raga, both of them by the same artist, but they're two different forms of it. It's it's still not a Raga problem, but it's a different thing of it, right? So So... It's, it's very important to have that cultural awareness when we're trying to address problems, which will make it more relevant to the signal at hand. Hmm. Also, a certain amount of cultural awareness is required when you are trying to extract these features from the audio signal itself. A knowledge of the, a knowledge of the content of the audio signal will help you extract the feature. A knowledge of what is being sung, for example. For, for example, if you try, let's come to tonic itself. If you know that the musician is singing sa at that point in time, and you know that sa is the tonic because of the culture, then you can use that information and you can choose those parts to train the model to identify such parts as being the sa, as being the tonic. Okay. So culture awareness also helps in that way. And if uh, for addressing your uh, question of if there is no tonic in a certain, if for a person there is no tonic or in a certain system there is no concept of tonic, how do you help that person? You there, So you first we understand, again culture aware means you understand that culture. We go into the we go into the music that does not have tonic. We try and use other principles of the music of the culture itself that we can use to train our machine to identify certain analytic um, um, problems that uh, we identify with the help of the person. Okay. Uh, I have one more thing to go add ahead, uh, because because uh, because this is still at the tonic level. So so. There are musicians who are trained in Western music who listen to Carnatic uh, or or Hindustani and say, "Oh, it's so jarring to listen to your uh, uh, drone, which is always there. It's it's so dominant." And yeah. for us, because we have normalized it, we really don't listen to the drone as such. I, I know right? people who get headaches. By the way. Yeah, we we actually don't listen so strongly about the drone. We are more concentrated on the melody. And so this this kind of analysis tells them how we have normalized our listening, yeah. and probably that would help them appreciate. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, I'm just going to jump in straight to the raga right now because I think that is one common ground uh, across uh, both art music systems and probably one of the most difficult things to uh, deal with, right? So, tell me, machine learning, signal processing, raga, I mean, what did you do? What was your data like and where are, I mean, have you progressed and what have you learned? So, I just want you to tell me that. Uh, so when I mean the, as as I think Vignesh uh, was pointing at the beginning, so there, there's a there's a lot of fascination around the raga recognition problem, which uh, if I were to formalize it, it's given an audio recording, you kind of label it to a particular raga. So this formulation itself is kind of sometimes flawed, mm -hmm. and then I mean of course, so I can can make, well, there are very broad approaches to this, and each of them is trying to kind of uh, decipher raga in a particular like only a, a limited viewpoint one is one of them it says uh, like raga is a grammar is like a grammar i mean these are all i would say they're they are not like complete descriptions but then they are like partial descriptions mm -hmm. so they say raga is a grammar now i want to kind of find how uh, a part set of notes that are being sung in a particular recording fits this grammar 
and anything that's closest fit you would say it's it's that particular raga then there was this idea of uh, like saying what are the notes that are sung like a scale so you ex- you can so each of these are like based on some assumption saying a scale is a raga or a particular grammar is a raga or a set of characteristic phrases are a raga and then when we make these assumptions we can build on them and then we can build techniques which use that particular fundamental assumption to recognize raga and they work to different uh, accuracy levels so to say on limited data sets on which we test on so i have a question so uh, you know even as as an uh, as a non non technology science person one of the fundamental struggles has been in the reductionist uh, notion of the raga uh, because uh, this is true of musicians musicologists everything this is not like listener these are practitioners who have also done this so uh, you know we brought down a raga to be either just a scale uh uh to make it so we say simple human machine learning uh, well we, i don't think we learn much from it but we've done it uh then you have another thing of saying okay we have a scale but we have few exceptions to it or we say these two phrases are its identity in every uh pattern that we've chosen one thing seems to be uh driving us is can we reduce the complexity to simpler understanding okay uh that to me has been one of the challenges of uh, of music learning as far as raga music learning happens now my question is when you for example um are taking signals raga signals um how do you keep it broad based in terms of the signals that you are capturing in terms of the logics that you're using in plural because there can't be one logic there's be i think multiple systems of logic so i want either kaustub or anjali to talk about the various logics for signals and how does the all the logics come together in the machine learning part if at all if it does kausam you are taking it first uh, sure you can take it first i can take okay. up talk about the okay. cognitive one of you randy is fine okay ahead. okay uh, yeah there are different ways as you mentioned in which raga is approached uh, you know uh, the way ajay was telling uh, you have the reductionist approach you look at it uh, from a single note uh, then the transition of notes and then uh, you already have inbuilt phrases into it and then you go ahead but that is not scalable so now can you discover phrases and then what uh, what should be the length when you're going to discover the phrases because it's a uh, uh if you look at 250 hours of music it is really a lot of lot of data from which you want to discover and and means in fact there a phrase itself can be understood in different fashion in different contexts yes 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 and yeah. phrase uh yeah as you said phrase can be a continuous contour from pitch or you can look at it as a sequence of notes and uh you can look at it as a uh you know a, a note plus a gamaka uh, there's there's various definitions again because uh there has been nothing very solid that has uh you know everyone has agreed upon so that that becomes a playground where you can actually check what is the one that actually describes the raga there uh, so so you try various approaches and see where uh, you are getting a maximum uh, uh you know a discovery or or a correct identification of the raga that that is one way to look at it uh the other thing is when you are having ragas which are very close by right which are which are very similar then then is uh, can we have commonalities as well as distinctions that are present so so uh, that is where uh, you start getting actually into the depths of the raga there i, I would put it that way um, uh, does that uh, to some sort summarize uh, no, no, and, and yeah it, it, it brings all the different various ways so and uh, kaus if you can just carry on from there and say what do you do yes i mean how did you what what information did you gather finally after all this see the thing is uh, from the pedagogy and performance because many of the works we did was from performance audio it was not a teacher demonstrating this is how a rock should be so this is kind of reverse engineering from a full performance concerts so now the question is in in context improvisation of a phrase or a development of a rock is very different from a theoretical construct how a rock is posed or how a rock is taught correct so then we had to find some cognitive phenomenon for example what does what is the information that really carries the raga information like what is the nucleus so maybe if we are singing on a note we are we are exploring a nyas swar mm. then uh, the phrase is very long but may not be the raga information or the relevant information is embedded in a very small span which it kind is, of is, is, is the right. listener it's a very interesting point you make uh it's a, i think a very musical uh-huh. point that you make which i'm going to mu- uh, say the musicify it before i give it back to you yes please the point is you're yeah. making is very important is that when i sing an alap for example yeah. uh 
if i'm going to take the alap is say is information about a raga if you're going to accept that mm -hmm. everything i sing is not giving um equal information about the raga so there are parts okay. where i am not giving information about the raga while i'm singing the raga this i think it's a fascinating idea for you know viewers to understand because we mm -hmm. perceive the whole right so fundamentally the viewer is if i'm singing a raga within the first 10 seconds i have already got you into the auditory world of the raga but when you, if you break all the information that i'm giving which is fundamentally what i'm singing there are parts where i'm not giving information but the listener is still deriving information but the information is not there in the data itself yes exactly. go ahead i just want to well, explain it because i think yeah. it's it's a it's very important for uh, us as musicians to actually realize it because it's a fascinating point go ahead it couldn't have been analyzed better so thank you for creating the perfect background for me so it's very much analogous to a kind of vowel consonant pair in speech you know for example in speech the consonants carry information and vowel carry the energy so in text message if you want to let me know come here and you write c m h r i get the information but correct. you can't utter only come here without the vowels correct so here what we found from our analysis is kind of long nyasvaras so they are kind of the energy holders that keeps the rhythm the proportionality but many a times the crucial information is embedded in the gamakas mm. for example the meers or the andolans so if we can deconstruct those particular information and chuck out the long steady nyasvar which is not so much information carrying then I mean, raga recognition becomes more evident very so these are like so crucial and not so crucial parts so can we seg segment them out very interesting go ahead uh, so for example even in in carnatic music when you look at it when you look at a, a swara you uh, you generally look at it as one one frequency but it is not one frequency so that's where you delve into the music aspect of it where it is not one frequency but it's a range it's a movement a swara itself is a movement so we can look at a phrase uh, as swaras or you can look at a phrase as a set of movements so when you look at it as a set of movements that has more information about the raga with which you can do a little more recognition or you can little more analysis so that uh, that that information comes from the music and uh, the musical knowledge so that's where we kind of collaborate with the music psychology of things so questions like how do musicians memorize these phrases exactly for example this this is a phenomenon i have interviewed many musicians they are from different gharanas the simple basic raga phrases if i request them to sing for me they are very similar mm. but when they are embedded in a larger performance in context they manifest in a very different way correct so so, so that, this, that's also this, interesting I, i mean I'm, that also tells us uh, you know a lot of times you know if i'm just going i'm i'm extrapolating from what you said is that um, again you said something important because we for example think uh, manodharma sangeeta or imaginative music is new but actually a lot of it is in rearrangement uh if i may use that word so uh, it's you know for example there could be the same phrases or pakads uh, which are common right but it is in the arrangement yeah, yeah. of this that interestingly you have uh, the the experience of something new or something that is yeah. you know, I'm, i'm not saying new things don't happen they do but this is also a certain very interesting way by which identity markers also happen and also i think uh, yes. manodharma is actually happening in the way these are arranged yes it's um, manifested in a different way with rearranging the building blocks to create new innovative ways it's not always new exactly beautiful right. quite beautifully put yes i so thought I have, i have a question for you since vignesh uh, uh, brought up that whole idea you also spoke on mindan gama can you also did now sometimes you could have two ragas that have the exact same sound i'm not even using uh, no sound okay yeah but in it could be called two different notes depending on which raga it is right right so yes. the question is mm -hmm. you and i recognize it culturally mm -hmm. okay because we are within that sound environment of rag music the question right. is what do you do with the machine if a machine doesn't know whether it's ga or re i i would put phrase as not just a note i would say it's a note with timing so time becomes very important right and how uh, that that essentially defines the movement there and so it's uh, that that is where the gamaka comes in you're, you're so, giving you're giving the answer to the problem 
<laughs> oh, yes, we have the answer to the problem. We have, we have done some amount of work on that. Time, time gives yeah. you context. Yeah. Time gives you context and yeah. context creates the... And, and, and in, yeah. with time, you give context to the machine and the machine kind of learns the context. Can you explain to the viewer when, when the term time is used, it's not the question of total duration that we're only talking about. We are talking about, if I may use another word that is different, a kind of a, a sense of pulse that is there within uh, the movement itself. Is yeah. what she's inferring to when she uses the word time. Uh, correct it's, me if I got it wrong. It, it's, it's, yeah. music, it's musical time. So it's yes. mostly relative uh, periods between the, uh, notes. the, the notes. Yes. Go ahead. So I'm, I'm just going to share screen here. And um, I show, I mean, I just want to show a couple of things that we have done with respect to sound. Uh, so what we did was we. Uh, asked musicians, this was a controlled experiment that we did, we asked various musicians to sing Varnams. Varnams are a form in Carnatic music where you have a definite correlation between the note and the sound that is produced. And uh, we used that correlation to produce a representation of the note, hmm. uh, a uh, sound based representation of the note which can be visually seen is what we try to do with this Varnam experiment. So um, we just took one note from two different ragas. So we had a set of some uh, number of Varnams and we saw we had ragas that had similar notes also. So we take that one note and see the visual representation of that, that note in two ragas which have the same note which are similar ragas also. So um, when, when we look at this, this shows this is called a pitch histogram. And uh, this basically tells you the amount of a certain frequency that is present. So okay. the, 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 the horizontal axis that you see is the frequency and uh, uh, frequency which is normalized by tonic. Mm. And okay. uh, the, the uh, y-axis, that is the vertical axis, is the amount of each frequency. Okay. That is how many number, number of times the frequency has occurred. So and this is... What is the sampling uh, size on this one? Do you remember? So we took uh, um, 10 musicians and 10 Varnams. So each yeah, Varnam, the, each, ra the Raga is Begada, right? The Raga is Begada. So we have 10 samples of the Begada Varnam. Okay, this is 10 examples. So go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so but when I say we have 10 recordings of the Begada Varnam, the number of instances of this frequency of Ga, uh, number of instances of Ga in that Varnam is large. When you multiply it by 10 people, you get that much amount of data. Exactly. So, so this is gathering all that information. You're gathering all that information. Averaging, averaging over multiple people. Okay. Yes. So, mul so, the, so the another thing I would like to emphasize over here is the importance of tonic normalization. Mul multiple people singing in multiple tonics. Yeah. So we normalized it by tonic and we have a certain normalized scale. Uh, this is called the scent scale, which we normalize by tonic. And it uh, on the on the horizontal axis you see the scent scale. So now if you look at the picture uh, pictorial representation of ga ga in Begara, uh, this is the pictorial representation. I'm not going to describe it. You see it. Now another raga Mohanam has the same technically musically has the same ga in it. Yes. So j just to add uh, add so the the numbers on the x axis, right? Ajay, can you get closer to the mic? Uh, sorry. So zero uh, zero right. for example is the sa is the shadja. Yes, Shadja. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so every two hundred approximate. In, I mean, uh, so it's it's it's. This is like a semitone. So hundred would be, uh, so half half note. Okay. So the 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 the, the Chatushruti and the Shatshruti versions of each of these. I think okay. uh, I'm using the right notation. Four hundred is the textbook definition of a ga. Okay. That way. So two hundred would be Two hundred would be re, and four hundred would be ga. If ga. we actually go by the absolute like text. So ga is antra gandhara, right? Antra gandhara, yes. Okay, okay, got it. So, but now you're showing me what is actually heard. Right. Okay, go on. So, four hundred is the is where antra gandhara lies, and we are plotting actually what is being sung and what is being heard. Okay. So, this is the shape that you get for ga in Begara. Interesting. Okay. It, it tells you that it's mostly that the variance tells you the the spread of the curve tells you that it's not varying that much. The it's it's almost around that four hundred and it is constant over there. So it is centered around the uh, the, the uh, swara, uh, swarastana position. Yes. Now you look at the ga in a raga like Mohana. Oh my God. Hmm. So you look at the ga in raga like Mohanam 
musical knowledge tells you that the ga is oscillating in mohanam and you can see it over here that the ga is oscillating in mohanam it is oscillating between that ga 400 antaragandara position crossing it goes over to pa my god okay and it goes over yeah. to pa and back so that is the range of you see two peaks over here correct so one is at 400 position one is at the 700 position yes 700 is uh, uh, would be panchava no 800 700 would be panchava 700 would be panchava yes. wow so, yeah, so, so this actually in a way also um, I mean, uh, it either not proves, but it also gives substantiations to perception, right? Right. Anyway. Right. Uh, but also, we don't know when we perceive. We also don't know the extent of perception. In the sense, we don't know the exactness of perception. Right. Uh, yeah. That also helps. Very interesting. This is very interesting information. Okay. And this this uh, goes on to uh, this is basically like a like like what Kautu mentioned before. This is working backwards. This is like a proof of concept. Correct. You know musically that the Gandhara and Mohanam is oscillating. Now we are proving this. It's like the, yeah. Yeah, continue. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So Go ahead. I think it is again, it again brings us back to the culture awareness because as a Hindustani music student, I might segment the Gandhar differently. Correct. Even if you're not singing the Gandhar as a solfege Gandhar, but within the lyrics of the song, then my segmentation of Gandhar will be different in your cultural contexts. Correct. So then, exactly. then this analysis will look very different. But there's another, so yeah, so the therefore, that, therefore cultural context is very important for somebody to be able to do this, right? Yes. 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 But I guess the inverse also can happen, right? Because in the yes, so totally. uh, you know, proof of, uh, shall we say, uh, presumption. But the other thing uh -huh. also happens that sometimes you believe something is that way, but does data mm -hmm. tell you that no boss, it is not like that actually? I'll stop this segment right here because, yeah, uh, sure. uh, and uh, uh, we'll move to the next segment, the next edition, mm -hmm. when we will go deeper into, we'll start with this problem and go towards uh, digging deeper in the Raga. Thank you very much and Great. join us again.